My mom feared for my life quite often in the lifestyle that I was living. At the time, I was living on my own because I had been kicked out of my house when I was 18 years old. I heard a loud bang. I heard my dog bark. Something hit my door and the whole door shook. Maybe had I left at that time, I would have been in that accident. I could have killed that man. And I thought to myself, if I go to sleep tonight and die, I'm not going to Jannah, I'm going to Jahannam. And I said to Allah, I will keep my hijab on. I will not let go of my religion for this dunya. I actually ended up getting to work on Star Wars. Who is Nyla Edwards? Can you tell us briefly about your background? Nyla Edwards is a lot of things. I think as a revert, we kind of have like two sides to us. So there's Vicky, who is pre-Islamic me, and then there's Nyla, who is the post-Islamic me. I've been able to carry some of who I used to be into who I am now, but a lot has changed in that time. I love filmmaking. I am someone who loves Dawa. I'm a mother. <laughs> as well, which is more of a new kind of side to me. I'm just a sister living in this world and trying to do my best to serve Allah with everything that I'm doing. How was your life in regards to faith? Did you have any faith before? Um, no, I was raised in an agnostic or atheist family. So my parents either don't believe in God or they are not sure. How did you first hear about Islam? Well, I didn't know that I'd heard about Islam at this time, but I guess this would be my first exposure. When I was in junior high school, so like 12 years old, I met my first sort of Muslim friend in Canada. She was Lebanese Canadian, and she taught me my first three Arabic or Islamic words, which were Allah, Wallah, Yalla. And every time we'd see each other, that's how we would greet each other for fun. So one of us would start by going Allah, and the other one would be like Wallah, and the other one would say Yalla, and then we would hug. That would be how we said hi to each other and I didn't know but that was uh, three very important Islamic words. That was sort of my first sort of introduction or exposure to Islam. What was the thing that made you research religions? So I was living in Malaysia. I'd moved there when I was 15 years old. And Malaysia is obviously a Muslim country. And so I was so interested. All these people have a religion. All these people believe in a God or gods of some sort. What makes people believe in a God? Because I was so set on the idea that there was no God. Like I wasn't looking at religions to find God. I was looking at them to discredit the fact that there was a God. I was actually doing it for the opposite purpose than searching for religion. You know, subhanAllah, after I became Muslim, this was one of the main things that I thought about was I never had an example of a Muslim in my life. I knew so many Muslims, but none of them lived Islam. None of them represented Islam. And that's why I always say if I had converted because of the people I knew, I would have never become Muslim because I didn't have that example. And I think that's why Allah had to bring me to Islam in a very different way than someone around me. What was the thing that made question your beliefs? Was it an event or a thought? And when was it? It started before I realized that it was going to make me question my beliefs. I was about 21 years old. I was living in Malaysia. My best friend was there from Canada visiting and we were just having housewarming. I just moved into this brand new house and I was upstairs. My best friend was downstairs and my dog was downstairs. So we were having a barbecue. The whole house was open. The glass sliding door and the wooden main door at the front of the house was open. And I heard a loud bang. I heard my dog dog bark and I just thought she'd hit something, knock something over. But when I went downstairs, my best friend looked terrified, completely petrified, frozen in her spot, staring at the door. And I asked her what had happened. And she said, my dog was walking towards the, the glass door and the door slammed shut in front of my dog. Nobody touched it. The wind could not close that door. It's not a swinging door. It's a sliding door. Like scientifically cannot close by itself and we couldn't understand why so we just like okay let's just go out we shut the house and we went out and i think we went out drinking and just forgot 
that it had ever happened. And then my best friend left. She went back to Canada. And over the next couple of months, things happened inside the house, but I found excuses for each one. So maybe I left something here when I left the house and when I came home, it was over there. Or I heard something fall in my room, but nothing had moved. Oh, it was just the neighbor. It was something else. You know, you just make an excuse for it until one night I came home and I went to my room. I put my dog in her room. I got ready for bed and I saw the light was on outside of my bedroom door. So when I went outside, I felt a feeling and this feeling I had felt once more in my life and I recognized it immediately. The feeling is like a gripping in my chest, not my heart, not my lungs, in the center, something tight. And I felt this once before when I was 14 years old in Canada. I had gone out with my brother and his friend who was very much into black magic and ghosts. We call them ghosts. Obviously we call them jinn, but you know, non-Muslims, they call them ghosts. And he took us to this corner that he called Ghost Corner. He sat us down, he was doing something. I don't know, I don't remember what it was. And as he was doing this thing, calling on the spirits, I felt this feeling and I didn't say anything. I just sat there and he just looked straight at me and went, leave. And I was like, why? And he's like, there's something here and it doesn't like you. And I got up and I ran because I felt that, you know, and I felt this feeling again in my house in Malaysia, you know, almost a decade later. And I couldn't see it. I didn't know what it was, but I felt where it was coming from. It was coming from the top corner of my stairs. And again, I got very scared because I remember this feeling something doesn't like me. <laughs> So I shut my door, I locked my door. Well, why would you lock your door against a ghost? But you know, what are you gonna do in this situation? And when I turned around, something hit my door and the whole door shook. And I was just, I was absolutely terrified. I didn't know what to do, I was helpless. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it wanted. I didn't know how to fight it, how to protect myself. And my mind was totally clear. And the only word in my mind was Allah. Without anything else in the world to grab onto, I said, Allah, if you exist, protect me. And then I just went and laid down in bed. I put my laptop on and I just closed my eyes and I went straight to sleep. And it rained so much that night. And rain is like purification. And when I read in the Quran later that, you know, Allah brought the rain in the night to cover you and to, to purify you. And, and I was like, SubhanAllah, that's like how I felt that night. And so when I woke up in the morning, I had to reassess everything. I had to think about what happened the night before? What does this mean? And so I spoke to Allah and uh, I made dua in a way. And Allah says, you know, if you want to be guided, just ask and you're guided, isn't it? So uh, without any knowledge of Islam or Allah or anything, I said, Allah, first of all, if you were there last night, thank you. And if you want me to be Muslim, you have to guide me because in 21 years of my life, nothing has ever shown me that you exist and no one could ever convince me that you existed. So guide me if this is what you want. After having that conversation with Allah in the morning, I think I felt, I just felt at ease. I think when you have Allah behind you, it's like you have an army behind you. I didn't feel afraid. I didn't want to live there anymore, but I didn't feel like anything was there waiting for me. And uh, from that day on, I was so interested in Islam. My boyfriend at the time was Muslim, so he had, subhanAllah, the answers to my questions. And so I started to ask him things like, why do you pray? What are you afraid of? What does Islam teach us? What does Allah want from us? And so he would teach me things like Allah loves patience. You know, Allah tells us to be patient. So when I feel impatient, I would try to remember Allah and I would say to myself, like, Allah loves patience, be patient. And I would see the situation change in front of my eyes. So I started like beta testing Islam in my life. I would start implementing Islamic values, living Islam into my life. This went on for about six months. During the six months, I also had a situation where I quit drinking completely. I stopped drinking alcohol. This was four months before I converted to Islam. And then it came Ramadan. And so I thought, if I'm gonna try to be Muslim, Ramadan's the time to do it because everyone's Muslim in Ramadan. But SubhanAllah, the day before Ramadan started, my boyfriend left the country to go back home for Ramadan. So I was totally alone to learn and be Muslim. I was just left on my own at this time. 
So I had to learn everything by myself. I got an English version of the Quran. I got some hijabs and I printed out how to pray and I put it down on the ground in front of me. And from the first day of Ramadan, I fasted. I prayed my five prayers and I read a juz of the Quran every day in English. So it was probably halfway through Ramadan, halfway through the Quran. And as I was reading the Quran, I continuously kept reading about myself. The person who has faith right in front of them, but they're blind, that they're being told the truth and they can't hear it. And I was like, this is me. Do I want to be this person? And it was Isha prayer. And I thought to myself, if I go to sleep tonight and die, I'm not going to Jannah, I'm going to Jahannam. And so I Googled, how do you say your Shahada? And I just sat there on my prayer mat and said, I bear witness, there's no God but Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. So just as I came to Islam, you know, with Allah only, I actually took my Shahada, just me and Allah as well, <laughs> SubhanAllah. How did you feel when you took Shahada? All I have in my head is the image of me on the prayer mat. I remember this feeling like angels are in your life, like SubhanAllah. The intercession and influence Allah has in your life all the time is so obvious. Allah says, I'm closer to you than your jugular vein. But as we sin, as we distance ourselves from Him, we don't actually feel that. There were times when I would cry because I felt so close to Allah. I would feel Him intervening in my life, protecting me in my life. There was one evening, it must have been a few months after I converted to Islam. I'd been at my friend's house that night and I'd left to go home. I got in my car, put in my GPS, and it kept taking me in circles. Takes me to a road that doesn't exist. Take me there. I could not figure out why I couldn't get out of this neighborhood. Like it was literally five meters, 10 meters from his house and I couldn't get away from this area. And eventually I just stopped someone in the street. I asked them, like, how do I get to this road? I ended up at a road, turned the corner and there had been a terrible accident. A motorcyclist was laying dead in the street. It must have only happened 15 minutes ago. And that was the time that I was meant to get to this road had I left directly from there, you know? And Allahu Alam, Allah knows best. But in that moment, I felt maybe had I left at that time, I would have been in that accident. I could have killed that man. And after I passed the accident, I just burst into tears. I cried the whole way home, thanking Allah for protecting me from being in that situation. And Alhamdulillah, I'm so blessed to have gone for Umrah just a few weeks ago. And after my second Umrah, I felt that feeling again. I felt the angels in my life once again. And I had been thinking about that feeling for 10 years. Like I actually frequently think how I felt then and how amazing it felt to be that close to Allah. And I begged Allah so many times to let me feel that again. And I was so happy to feel that after Umrah. And I'm trying so hard to like hold on to that and not sin and not distance myself from Allah at all. Because I think everyone needs to feel this and appreciate it and just hold on to it. How did your family and the people around you react to your conversion to Islam? My parents were actually so happy. Now, this one shows the character of my parents being very accepting, and two shows just how terrible I was. My mom feared for my life quite often in the lifestyle that I was living. And the fact that Islam changed like 100% how I was living my life was such a relief for them. It's actually improved our relationship substantially because at the time I was living on my own because I had been kicked out of my house when I was 18 years old. We were not on speaking terms really when I converted to Islam. And then after that, I built that relationship back with them. I did have an issue in my family. My aunt who was my closest relative. She was my only aunt. I used to go to England and like sit there and brush her hair for like hours and like we were so close. Like I, she's my memory when I think of going to England as a child. And she messaged me on Facebook one day and said, I can't believe what you've done your grandmother would roll over in her grave if she saw you now. Why have you, this was after I wore hijab. She was like, why are you changing yourself? It caused a big issue in my family. My parents stopped talking to her for a number of years. I didn't talk to her for a number of years. I was actually very relieved when they started talking again because I felt like I had been a splinter in my family and breaking the ties of kinship is so bad. 
in Islam, we have to keep our families close. And only recently she actually messaged me. It was so nice to be able to bridge that gap again because I felt like somebody I really loved in my life had been taken away from me because of this decision that I had made. As for my friends, I think they were all pretty shocked. A lot of them would never have expected that from me based on my views, but they were all really happy. My work was not a positive experience. They prized me as the white girl that I was beforehand in my mini skirt and everything and put me at the front and show me off. Then I covered up and I became less valuable to them, which really hurt my own self-esteem. It really hurt my confidence. I stopped going in front of camera because of it for a very long time. It took a long time to get my identity sorted. I felt like I'd lost my identity by becoming a Muslim and it took a long time to kind of rebuild that in myself. How is it like to be a Muslim in England? There's pros and cons. I think compared to other European countries, we're quite free to practice our religion, but like non-Muslim countries, there is Islamophobia, there is far-right extremism. I struggled a lot in the past, especially when Islamophobia was really on the rise. There was a lot of attacks on hijabi women in Europe. I remember in like Germany or somewhere, there was a hijabi woman pushed down the stairs at a train station. I ended up, especially when I was pregnant, very paranoid. I had anxiety. I had depression. I was convinced every time I left the house that I would get attacked. I couldn't walk next to the train on the platform because I thought somebody would push me in front of the train. I never had experienced Islamophobia up to that point. People mostly look at me because I'm white, like I'm a traitor. They'll look at me like, oh, you betrayed our country by becoming Muslim, which I'm fine with. I don't really notice people. I try not to actually look at anyone when I'm walking down the street anyway, because I don't need that stress in my life. My darker skin friends, my Asian friends, my Arab friends, my African friends, they get much more racism and Islamophobia than I do. But I mean, there is one time that I spoke about on my YouTube channel that I was actually, before I became a Niqabi, I was filled filming a video about the hypocrisy of being illegal to not wear a mask, but being illegal to wear a niqab, which is basically a mask anyway. Before I'd even put my niqab on, I was wearing a black abaya. Uh, I got called a terrorist in the middle of central London in a very busy, very upper class neighborhood and by a person of color as well, which I found shocking that they must have experienced prejudice and racism in their life. To return that to me so ignorantly was very, very heartbreaking. But Alhamdulillah, in that moment, I kind of reflected and asked Allah to, to show me what's the best way to respond. And the way that I thought is how would Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu respond? How did Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam respond when the children were throwing rocks at him and insulting him? Did he yell at them? Did he throw rocks back? No. He yelled, you're a beeping terrorist at me. And I yelled, peace and love, brother. Peace and love. It's hard for a lot of people to live in the West. You are different if you wear hijab. You're even more different if you wear a niqab, which I'm learning now. It's very, very different than living in a Muslim country. You miss the adhan. You miss the community spirit. It's not easy. I loved living in Muslim countries and I lived in Muslim countries for the whole first sort of four years of my Islamic life. So it was very different when I came over to the West and started living in a non-Muslim country finally. How is it like to be a hijabi in the film industry? It's very difficult to be a hijabi in the film industry. People have a preconception of you when they see you in hijab, when they see you visibly Muslim, they think you're not gonna be creative, you're oppressed, you are conservative. All of these things that don't kind of match with creativity they assume about you. When I went to Dubai after that, I was homeless and jobless for about six months in Dubai. But it was a lesson from Allah because Allah showed me that as long as you rely on Him alone, Allah will give you more in this life and more in the next life. So I was about six months into being jobless and homeless in Dubai, living on my friend's couch. And the waswas came, the whispers from Shaitan came and said, take off your hijab. You'll get a good job. You'll get a great pay. You can put it on later. It's fine. And I was like, should I do it? I thought about it and I said to Allah, I will keep my hijab on. I will not let go of my religion for this dunya. I know you're going to take care of me because you are with the believers. The next job interview I went to, I got that job interview because they were so interested to know who is this Victoria Edwards with a hijab in the film industry. And I ended up getting that job, subhanAllah. And through that job, I actually ended up getting to work on Star Wars. 
It was such an amazing experience. And I remember on the last day, I stood there with my extras. The sun was setting over this desert planet in the solar system somewhere far, far away. And I just remember thinking, Alhamdulillah. I wanted to do sujood al sugar right there in the sand. When you love something, it doesn't matter how much it hurts to do it. You know, we were waking up at 5 a.m. and sleeping at 1, 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Like we were only having two to four hours of sleep a night, but you would jump out of bed when the alarm rings and just rush into it and then run around the desert in the heat all day. So I remember there was a British actor. He was in one of the big costumes. He was one of the characters in the costumes. But I remember I walked into the tent because it, it's a marketplace. So there's a big tent and I walked in and there was the director having a conversation with him me being like the fangirl that I am just kind of stood there like this about five feet away from them and just like okay you guys are having a conversation this is so cool I was mostly running around the desert filling water and giving electrolytes to my cast so they don't pass out in the middle of the desert but there were these little gem moments you know and now when I watch the film I know where I was hiding during that. And it was it was really amazing watching the explosions go off because there's a big fight scene between two spacecrafts at the end of that scene. So, you know, there was a lot of explosions, there was a lot of gunfire, there were stormtroopers. So it was like it was the whole Star Wars experience. What was your purpose in life before Islam? And what is after Islam? My purpose in life before Islam was nothing. My purpose after Islam is to worship and serve Allah with everything that he's given me. People think that you're free when you live that life. You live the Western white life, that you're free. You're not. You're a slave to this idea of society that never makes you happy. You're constantly chasing the next moment to be happy. And then after Islam, you're always happy. Even if you're sad, you're happy because one, you know Allah is there listening to your tears. Two, you know that there's goodness coming from that difficulty. Allah says, with hardship comes ease, not after it. Many people interpret that as after after hardship comes ease. Of course it does, because life is good and bad and good and bad. That's not what Allah is saying. He's saying that through your hardship, with your hardship is coming a blessing and you just don't know it yet. You can't see it yet. You need to step back before you can, subhanAllah. What led you to Gaza in the middle of the war? Personal reasons took me to live in Gaza. I had such a close connection with Palestine because there's so many Palestinians in Malaysia. And so I'd learned so much about their struggle. I'd convinced my family to support Palestine over Israel. I was so passionate about it. And the people that I'd met from Palestine are so amazing. They're so strong, they're so inspirational. And I thought to myself, I just wanna be there. And so when I got the opportunity to live in Gaza, I just took it and I went. And I lived there for three months. If I could live anywhere in the world, it would be Palestine. It's such a blessed land. It's such a blessed people. And you wouldn't think that after what they go through day and day. But living there makes you so close to Allah because we live these lives where death is so distant. But it's something we should think about often. And when you're in a war zone, when you could literally get hit by an airstrike at any second, you don't delay. The adhan goes, you're in wudu, you're ready to pray, subhanAllah. It really is living in an open air prison. And the stories that I heard from the people when I was there are not the stories that you hear on social media. They're not the stories that you hear in the news. They are far worse. What's actually happening to people and families and the human stories there. When they were telling me about what happens during the war, how they get told to leave their homes and they have to go in the middle of the night carrying whatever they can, no vehicles because they'll bomb the vehicles, just staying in the shadows. They were telling me about one night that the bombing had already started. And as they were walking to the city, center they came across a woman and this woman was carrying a bag with her she was carrying this bag and inside the bag were the pieces of her son who had been killed by I don't know if it was a shell or by an airstrike as they were trying to leave and she didn't want to leave her son's body there whatever might happen to it she wanted the chance to bury him and so she picked up his pieces and was carrying them with her to the city center in order to be able to like bury her son in peace. These are the things that are happening every time there's a war, every time there's an airstrike, every time there's an aggression by Israel. It's unbelievable the resilience and the strength that these people have, subhanAllah. So I still have a very, very close love and passion for Palestine, protest and petition and do whatever I can. And if I ever get the chance, inshallah, I'll go back.
What impressed you the most about our prophet, peace be upon him? Oh, gosh. There's so many things. If I would put it to one thing, it would be his character. But there's so many different aspects of his character that are amazing. There's so many different points in your life that you can reflect on a different part of his character. For example, when I became a mum and I knew nothing about parenting, I read the book Children Around the Prophet and I learned how the Prophet peace be upon him, would deal with children. The mercy, the patience, the time that he spent, the understanding of their age and their ability to comprehend what you're telling them and how you tell them. It was so beautiful. He wasn't a yeller. He wasn't a hitter. He spoke on a level. He got down on a level with children. There's so many amazing things in his personality, in his character, in the way that he ruled, in the mercy that he had, in the love that he had as a husband, as a leader, you know, as a friend, subhanAllah. It's just, how can you name one thing? It's impossible. Which day of our prophets, peace be upon him's life, would you choose if you could watch 24 hours of it? I would watch the first moment he got revelation. I would watch how he reacted to something so unexpected, so miraculous, so unbelievable, and how he ran to his wife, Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, and her support for him. She just, she believed him instantly. She comforted him. He was vulnerable and she covered him and she encouraged him and supported. It's such a beautiful moment. What an amazing moment that changed our lives. It was the moment of Islam coming to us and it was came in such a beautiful way. There's so many lessons to be learned from it. Is there anything else you'd like to say as a final thought? Every time you leave your house, remember that your character is representation of our deen. Be over kind. Ask the questions that nobody asks. Ask the cashier, how are you today? Make their day because by doing that as a Muslim, you are forcing them to associate Islam with kindness. And that's what Islam is. Even if you don't have money, just being kind to someone is charity. Imagine yourself, if the Prophet saw you out in the street, would he be proud? or ashamed that you're from his ummah. And if you live with that thought in your mind, Islam is going to spread like wildfire and it's not going to be able to stop because of the kindness and love that is going to be spread with it.